Hey gang, welcome to Big Brother and the Holding Company, which is a podcast about music and Web3 and trying to fend off Big Brother. I'm a Keegan Voice. Today I spoke with Lottie Day. Lottie is a native New Yorker who grew up writing songs, winning an award from ASCAP New York before moving to Los Angeles to pursue songwriting. The pandemic interrupted that journey, but it led her to Web3, where she's held a variety of roles, from head of community and partnerships for EQ Exchange, which was a Web3 music startup co-owned by Ashanti, to the director of social and partnerships for Campfire, which is a guild and community for Web2.5 music artists and professionals, to being the manager of pop fusion artist TK, who's released of Eternal Garden, an audio visual music non-fungible token or NFT collection generated over 38 Ethereum, which as of this recording is close to $75,000, and became a paragon of world building in this space. Lottie also has a newsletter and her own podcast and is incredibly active across Web3 music communities. We chatted about all of her projects, as well as the importance of partnerships in Web3 community building, the role of AI in the music industry, and how Web3 can actually work alongside artificial intelligence to curb some of its potential harm. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Here we go. All right. Hey, Lottie, it's great to have you here. Keegan, good to be back. What's up? Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. It's relatively good weather in New York. <laughs> nice. Happy to hear that. It's pretty cloudy with pretty high chance of rain here in London, which is pretty typical. Sounds like London, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's really great to have you on. Thank you for being here. And as usual, I always like to start at the beginning and dive into your story, hear about where you grew up and when your relationship with music started. Yeah, so I am born and raised in New York, and I'm someone who has loved music pretty much my whole life. My parents are not in the music industry, but I would say that they are musically inclined, and they had a love for music because it was always playing in my house. Granted, for the most part, it was very religiously <laughs> related music because my family's Christian. But that love is always there. I've been singing in church and since I was a little girl. Cool. And I remember watching Disney Channel <laughs> and seeing all the Disney stars and the Mickey Mouse Club and all of that. And I was just like, this looks really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do this. And Britney Spears is one of my very early, early inspirations, Destiny's Child, just artists like that. Mm. And Sync loved all of that. The boy bands, Me too. Backstreet Boys, <laughs> as well. all yeah. of it. And I remember just wanting to really delve into pop. And I had just been doing my research and kind of seeing, okay, like how can I get involved with those things? And one of the things that I had seen is that you, you go to performing arts school. And so I talked to my parents and I was like, I want to go to performing arts school. And they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> they were Because for them, it's like the entertainment industry was like super scary and un uncertain and it wasn't a place for a child. And they were just like, you just need to go to school and read your books and learn things and get a job and save the world as a doctor and I was like, okay <laughs> cool no small task right exactly <laughs> they're immigrants so that, that's just the mentality and so mm. I spent a lot of my time studying music listening to music and watching music videos like on the low right it's gonna fast forward to Napster LimeWire the iPod and that's how I would get my fix listening to mostly hip-hop and just they had no clue what was going on. But I really didn't get into music more so professionally until I was like a lot older, like basically after college. Got it. And what was the what was the first step into pursuing it professionally? At which point were you like, okay, I know my parents weren't cool with me doing it as a kid, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyways. So for me essentially one of the cool things about new york is that there's it's a great music scene here mm. and there's just a lot of creatives in general and so even when i was in school i had met a lot of people and made a lot of friends that were in that world and then naturally something that happens is that you go to their events or you go to their shows or you go to whatever else and so that's what i did and Further down the line, I started booking studio time and just figuring out ways to involve myself on my own accord. So like after I graduated college, 
I got a regular job. I was doing the regular job and I would work nine to five. And then after that, I would go to the studio or I would go to a show or I would make music with friends. And I quickly realized that I was never going to be happy just doing it as a side thing. And so I quit my job. I didn't tell my family. <laughs> I quit my job. <laughs> I, and you know what? One of the big sparks for me was actually ASCAP Expo. So I had done a little bit of traveling to LA. That's where I would do studio time out there as well. I went to ASCAP Expo in May in 2018. And I told myself, by the end of this year, I need to be living in LA. That's it. No ifs, ands, or buts. And I then had entered a songwriting competition with ASCAP. I placed in that second place and that kind of lit a fire under me to really pursue it. And by November of 2018, I had moved to LA on a whim. I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't have a place. Lined. I didn't. I just went on like a cross country road trip cool. with a friend and I was like, we're going to California. And that was it. Oh man, what a dream. That sounds amazing. And yeah, I mean, you did it. You set out to move to California that year and you went to LA. So then what, I mean, you got to LA without much lined up. What happened after that? So that's where the hustle began. So I did have mm -hmm. some savings when I got out there. We just stayed in an Airbnb and obviously not really knowing LA. You don't know what are the safest parts, what are the most expensive parts or whatever. So initially mm -hmm. we got a spot in WeHo. If you know anything about WeHo, it is not cheap. And so everything was expensive, but so obviously the Airbnb was, but even like just getting food or right. getting my nails done. I was like, why is this so much money? And it's because we're <laughs> literally like right next to Beverly Hills. Like it's not mm -hmm. cheap over there. But anyway, so what I was doing was just gigs. I would find stuff on Craigslist or backstage and I would do things like PA work or be extra in independent films or music videos and stuff mm. like that. Eventually I picked up a server job and was doing that. And this job is in Beverly Hills. And I remember like within a couple of weeks of being on the job, one of the patrons was Frank Ocean and I almost <laughs> lost my shit. Whoa. <laughs> fan of him as most people in music are especially sure. if you're someone who's pursuing songwriting and so frank ocean and steve lacy come in and i'm wow. shook <laughs> <laughs> you know one of the policies obviously at this job is that you're not supposed to like fan out you know sure. when yeah. we come through but i had to walk up to them and be like listen i love y'all i'm so inspired by what you do yeah. i had actually met steve lacy at a workshop at the apple store in brooklyn back when I was living in New York and I told him, I was like, I met you at the Apple store. And he was like, oh yeah, I remember that event. And I was like, oh my God. But anyway, and Steve and, and <laughs> Frank was like basically quiet. He didn't say anything, but he smiled mm. though, at least. It was really just for me, I was like, this is a sign that I'm supposed to be in music. Uh, like, totally. what are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, it seemed like the universe was conspiring in your favor to bring- Very much to bring that. All together. Very much that, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So then what happened? Yeah, so from there, it was just like doubling down. Doubling down, going to the studio, going to events, going parties. And the unfortunately, the server job didn't last very long, <laughs> <laughs> as is typical for LA. I, I probably had 12 different jobs the entire time I was out there. Fair. But I was just really focused on being creative and meeting the right people. And eventually it got to the point where like my demos were going around and I was meeting different publishers because my goal at the time was I was like, okay, I want to sign a publishing deal with Warner or Universal or Sony or whatever. So mm -hmm. I was meeting different a &Rs, I was playing them my stuff. And I have to say, like being a songwriter independently and coming up is probably one of the most discouraging <laughs> types sure. of jobs in the industry because nobody really cares about songwriters nobody wants to pay you nobody really wants to give you a chance sometimes like it's really hard mm -hmm. to get into certain rooms it's a lot of hoops you have to jump through and my respect for songwriters grew so so much i had mm -hmm. done a couple of short like classes and workshops at 1500 sound academy which is owned by the guys over at 1500 shout out to rance and james fauntleroy but wow like people like that and you're like how you even got to this point in your career is 
incredible. Yeah. And so I was just trying to keep the dream alive and make it happen, being a starving artist, as they say. And I felt like there were different instances where I was like, okay, I'm getting like closer to what I wanted to be doing. And then the pandemic came and that right. threw everything off. Right. Yeah, it ruined a lot of things, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did that, yeah, specifically for you and for the way you were thinking about your career in music, how did, how did it change things for you? How did you pivot? How did you work through it? Honestly, it did uh, damn near 180 over time. So essentially mm -hmm. what happened was the lockdown occurred, which all of the studios were caused to close down temporarily. And there were also curfews in LA. So it wasn't even like I could stay out and collaborate with people at their houses, because if that was the case, I have to stay overnight until the curfew was over. So it was like really wild dystopian times. <laughs> <laughs> they were um, and so at that point I was living with two of my friends, Jordan and Brandy. Jordan, who is an artist and an engineer. Brandy, who's an, en who's an artist who knows how to engineer. And they were just like, oh, you, you just need to learn how to use Pro Tools. If you can't see, go to a studio work with an engineer, you got to learn how to do it yourself. So they helped me right. set up my template and everything. And I had already had some equipment. Like I had my laptop and interface and all these things, but I never thought I'd really need to use them. But I was like, okay, now's the time to sit down with my friends, learn how to do stuff, watch YouTube videos. So I just taught myself how to record in Pro Tools and how to do a light enough mix that's allowed the song to be demo ready. I learned how to produce in Logic. Granted, I'm mm. not that great of a producer, but mm. I can make a little beat nice. <laughs> if I need to. <laughs> Shout out to Splice. <laughs> and just do like enough to get the songs where I needed to get them or to collaborate with folks remotely or whatever else. And so through that, I was able to get a lot of stuff synced. That's how I stayed afloat, working remote, just through like different music supervisors or sync agents I would send stuff to. And then I also would work with independent artists and then they would pay me a fee or a rate for whatever types of songwriting work I had done with them. And yeah, I ended up working pretty closely with Mickey Shiloh at Hard Drive. I had done a writing camp with her the month before the lockdown happened. And then from there, she brought me on to just help out with like social media related stuff and operations. And that helped me get my foot in the door more so on the business side of things. And from there, Clubhouse happened, which was oh, yeah. quite a time. You know, it's one of those <laughs> things that you just had to be there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I had got on around October. The music industry folks started coming on around summer to fall. So I would join during that wave and that opened a whole new world in terms of meeting different people and having different types of conversations. But also the cool thing about Clubhouse is that you got to meet professionals from different fields. So you can be in rooms with folks in finance or folks in tech and whatever else. And at that time, that's when Web3 was surged. It was crazy. I think Bitcoin was like 60K. Yeah. Like it was nuts. And I was just like, okay, what is this? But I didn't really care too much about it initially because there's a lot of talk about like PFPs and Ethereum. And I was like, I don't know what these things are, why they're important, but okay. And then I started seeing folks that I had known. One of the biggest examples was Latasha, who is here in New York. And I remember just going to her performances and just seeing her continue to grind independently and then seeing her win really big in Web3, having her music video sell for 50K worth of ETH. I was like, yeah. hold on, <laughs> what is happening? What is this? <laughs> and so I realized, okay, like th there's a place for musicians in this space. And I decided to go down the rabbit hole, meet folks, join Twitter spaces, join discords, the whole nine. And then at the time, once things started opening up again, I had entered this sort of incubator for musicians and music folks. And so I had I went back to L.A. for that for a couple of months. And then that startup actually ended up shutting down. And the woman, one of the co-founders, had started another startup in Web3. And she had asked me if I could join to help out with social as a contractor. And I said, yeah, sure. 
because I wanted to get involved in that world anyway. So that was my first kind of like job or like official gig in Web3 music. And then from there, I've just been growing and going and doing the thing. Cool. Uh, what was the name of that startup and what was your role in it? Yeah, so it was called EQ Exchange. Initially, I started out doing social media management. And then from there, it was community management. And then from there, it was partnerships, community, social, the whole thing. The startup is funny because you'll start out doing one thing. And then once they figure out you can do other things well, they're like, oh, can you do this and this? <laughs> yeah. And then you get raises and you get this, that, and the third. And I was there for about a year. Yeah. And since then, you've you've done a lot of stuff. You've been involved with a lot of different projects from Campfire. Yeah. Working with TK. Yeah. How's that been? Like, I'm always impressed. I see your name everywhere. I feel like there's three <laughs> of you active on every single platform. You know, I don't people know how you always do it. say that. They're like, how do you have time for anything? And I'm just like, a schedule, scheduler, schedule all my posts. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So working with TK and Campfire has been awesome. And, and that's more in, the, in line with things that I like to do. TK is just a really dope independent artist, but he's someone who I had known from my web two days. So there's actually a lot of overlap there. So when I had first moved to LA, he was one of the first artists that I had seen perform. I had made a point to go to all types of events out in LA, whether they were mixers, whether they were open mics, whether they were parties, whatever. And so I had gone to this showcase and I didn't know him or anyone there, but I just wanted to see who the local talent was. And I remember him performing and I was like, this dude is so talented. But as you go up to someone, you tell them they're dope, you exchange Instagrams. or, And then I ended up seeing him a few more times because he would have different parties and events at his house. And so then I would go to those and you get to talking and he's obviously, I know he's an artist. And I'm telling him I'm a songwriter and he was just like, oh, I'm going to keep you in mind for when I have like my writing camps. Mm. And then he ended up going to writing camp. I went to that and it was to this day, one of the best writing camps I've ever attended. He's just so good at curating, as you can see with anything that he does. And we became a lot closer. But then obviously, again, like with the way the pandemic happened, I wasn't really seeing a lot of people IRL. And then I ended up moving right. back to New York. And so then I had seen on Twitter one day that he had a sold out collection on Sound XYZ. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I texted him. I was like, oh my gosh, congrats. I didn't know you were in Web3. And he was just like, yeah, like I, just, I got into it like really recently. I was like, me too. And then we just started talking. And, and he was like, are you going to be at NFT NYC? And I said, actually, yes, because I'm planning an event there for work. Because at the time where I was working, Ashanti was a co-owner in the company and we were mm -hmm. planning an event for her to be the keynote speaker. And so I was like, yeah, like I'll make sure you come through to that and I'll go to whatever you're going to. And then we reconnected in person and it was around that time also he was looking for a manager that had an understanding of Web3 because he already had a team of a couple people, but they were all like Web2 folks. And he was like, I'm really looking for someone to help me on the Web3 side because I feel like that doesn't exist. And he mm -hmm. low-key was ahead of his time with that one because I hadn't even heard of a Web3 manager <laughs> before he asked. And at the time I was like, oh, I don't know, my work schedule is really crazy. I don't know anything about managing artists and everything I've heard is terrible. So yeah. I don't know if I <laughs> want to do that kind of work. And he was just like, let's just try it out. And so I said, okay, like basically I told them we can try out like a trial period for a couple of months. And if it works, we can extend. And if it doesn't, we can just stay friends. Yeah. And that was June or so of last year okay. that happened. And we started plotting towards Eternal Garden. Mm -hmm. That was like around three months worth of planning prior to the actual launch. It was really successful. That really helped both of us in terms of making our stamp in the Web3 music world. And, and now we're still rocking together and it's been dope. Cool. That's amazing. I think I asked you this the first time we connected, but I'm curious because you had heard so many bad things about you know, <laughs> being an artist manager. <laughs> What was it that kind of tipped you over the edge? Oh, maybe I'll do this. And then what did that entail? What was that first few months? Like, how were you connecting? Like, what what was your role exactly as you were in that relationship? For sure. I think for me, the reason I said yes to it, despite <laughs> the horror stories, is because I actually <laughs> liked him as a person mm. and as an artist, which I think is one of the number one things. If you want to get into management, you have to be really passionate about 
the person that you're representing. So you, sure. you have to love the music they're creating, but you also have to like them. Like, I, I don't think I could manage someone who I dislike or if I didn't like their sound, even if they were <clears throat> had a lot of potential to be very successful or whatever. I just don't mm-hmm. know if I could be along for the ride. And then but also besides that, I like the fact that he had a little infrastructure to begin with. It wasn't like we were starting from the ground up. He had already had folks on his team that he was working with on the Web2 side. And then he also himself is someone who's really business savvy. So besides just being an artist, he also does like freelance consulting. And he was working with a lot of different startups, especially in the Web3 music space and advising them. And I was like, wow, that's really cool that you're doing all that. Because a lot of times people are like, I'm an artist. I just want to make art. And that's fine. I respect it. But he was able to find other avenues where he can exercise his expertise and be able to fund himself without getting a full-time job. And so I respected that. And so essentially when I first joined, most of what I was doing was related to like project management for Eternal Garden. So he came to me mm-hmm. with his Notion doc, which is very comprehensive, all the mm-hmm. things that he wanted to actualize. And so my job was essentially putting all of the pieces together to help him execute that vision. And most of it, honestly, was bringing in folks that we could partner with. So he had a lot of folks that he already knew that he was talking to, but I also had people on my end. And a lot of that was actually through my work at EQ Exchange. So I was doing partnerships there. So it was pretty mm-hmm. easy for me to alley-oop them into this project. And a lot of it too is just randomly through Twitter or through LinkedIn. You send a cold DM, people respond. They're like, let's hop on a call. You talk to them, you share the deck. They're like, okay, let's do it. And then they ape in as well. So that's what, where most of the focus was initially. And again, that was very much in tandem with what I was already doing. It was just more of the same work, but for something that I actually was interested in. <laughs> and yeah, that's how it was. Cool. Yeah. One of the things that really came out of that that seemed really interesting was like the creation of the street team that, that came out of Eternal Garden. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. For sure. Yeah. Like I said, like TK is someone who he's really good at getting people to be on his side in terms of being invested in what he's doing and what he's creating and envisioning. And I think he's someone who is the best at world building in Web3. And so there were a lot of different folks who would come to us with proposals of things that they thought we could do to enhance what we were doing and expand the Eternal Garden universe. And I was like, wow, this is so dope. It's like, we don't even have to necessarily go out of our way Mm. (laughs) to find folks. And so one of our main partners, which was Mochi, the founder, Gabe, had come to us with a really interesting and novel idea in partnership with Ravi at the 402 about having a digital street team and they had a deck and they showed us how it would work. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. And so then we kept ideating with them and creating any sort of tweaks to that plan and seeing how we can execute it. Because one thing about a lot of artists, TK included, is that they don't really love content creation. Mm. (laughs) TikTok is not something that they think is fun. (laughs) It's like extra work for them. So essentially... Mm -hmm. When Gabe and Ravi were like, we have this idea of how we can gamify TikTok and incentivize fans to post on your behalf. I was like, this is brilliant. This is, it's never been done. And one thing about TK and I, we love to venture into territory that has not been explored before. So we were like, okay, let's try this out. Let's do it. And so we figured it out with them over the course of a couple of weeks. And once we solidified the game plan, we announced it. We had a Zoom call to get folks on board. We created the Discord and all that. And it was really amazing seeing the results, all of it, and just seeing how people were having so much fun doing it. And it's for anyone who has been paying attention or interested in music, especially like in like the nineties, early 2000s, street teams were all the rage, right? Like they're, they would post your posters everywhere. They would sell your CDs in the street. Like they would be wearing your merch. It's like, they would do all these things to get everyone to join Mm -hmm. your team in the physical sense. And, but we lost a lot of that with the advent of streaming. And so for it to be reinvented, In the digital sense, we were like, okay, we're so game for this. And then from there, a bunch of other artists came through to us. We're like, we want to try out what you guys are doing. And it really helped with helping his music get out there. 
growing his presence on TikTok and if we had even tried it for maybe longer. And that was only a month, like a month getting all of these likes and all these views and all these shares. And if we had tried it for three months or six months, who knows like how much farther it could have went. But huge shout out to Mochi and the 402 because they're the ones who really made all of that possible for us. And we appreciate them believing in us. And the 402 is actually a hype shot now. I forgot they changed their name. But yeah, it's, it really, partnership is so important. People talk about community and all these things. And community matters when it comes to individuals, but it also matters when it comes to DAOs and organizations and other things of that nature, because mm-hmm. then you have way more people on your side within one entity. Yeah, totally. It seems like a really effective way to leverage a community. And I love like the kind of the throwback to the nineties, activating street teams and having people rallying on your behalf. I wonder if you could yeah. take just like one small step back and just talk about what the eternal garden is for people who don't sure. know. And then exactly like, what did it look like when people on the street team were showing up? What kinds of things were they doing? Yeah, so Eternal Garden is a universe created by TK, and essentially it tells the story of Caius. And one thing, if you know anything about TK, he is a master storyteller. You you need to just get the NFT and actually read the whole story. Eternal hyphen garden dot X Y Z. But seriously, it's essentially he has these really vivid visions of what he wants to create and then he builds a story with the music so there's seven songs in this particular project and it's a whole audio visual experience so like the music obviously is stunning but a lot of the different graphics also correlate really strongly with the vision of each of the songs and tk when we had first started working together he told me that he was interested in doing a high volume NFT drop and we've seen it in the past with folks like Daniel Allen and Violetta, Sammy Ariaga, just a bunch of really amazing artists doing their thing and he wanted to make his stamp as well in this way but with a lot of focus on the narrative both visually and sonically and so that is where I came in and that's how we continue to expand that but a lot of it came from him like his mind when it comes to the aesthetics the visuals, the soundscapes, it's just, it's like nothing you've ever seen or heard before. And it's very like fantastical. And it was amazing just seeing people relate so strongly to that and be very drawn in to what it is that he was building. And so there was a lot of focus on creating the different assets for that and just like repetition in terms of what people saw. So whether it was us using like the flower emoji or like the particular GIF or videos that we had and just like stamping for people, okay, this is Eternal Garden and this is what it represents and mm-hmm. this is how you can get involved. And these are the things that you're going to get used to seeing and hearing. And we were just feet against the pavement, pushing it on Twitter predominantly, but also on LinkedIn and Instagram. And also shout out to the good folks at Lalo as well and Lens because that allowed us to be able to tap in more deeply with our Web3 supporters. And from there, that is how we were able to successfully sell out 700 NFTs, generate 38 ETH worth of revenue. And then that's the follow-up to that was Pedal Power, which is a digital street team. And that kind of was able to push it into Web2 because now these songs are being released via the DSPs traditionally. So that's how it all came together. Cool. That's an amazing vision and a great idea. I mean, I think the importance of world building, especially in Web3 is really, really big and really paramount. Yeah. But also the creative opportunity for an artist to just be able to think and dream up like anything that they want to, any narrative. And because we have the technology that can actually manifest these worlds and allow us to bring people into them is really amazing. hundred percent. So then you two also are involved in Campfire, which is another project. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. 
For sure. Yeah. So Campfire, again, the brainchild of TK, he had actually founded it initially during the clubhouse days. And so mm. the campfire that you know and see today is in a lot of ways like the rebirth, the relaunch of that initial vision. He essentially wanted a way for musicians, creatives, whether that's songwriters, artists, producers, whatever else, to be able to have a safe space to create and discuss the things that they wanted to see change within the Mm -hmm. industry without the influence of platforms or protocols or necessarily even executives or anyone who's not tied to music creation and artist advocacy. So it's been really incredible seeing Campfire continue to blossom. And we have a dedicated core team of folks. We have a dedicated community We went from being essentially virtual, hosting Twitter spaces and things of that nature to bringing it IRL last quarter at, actually now two quarters ago, time flies, (laughs) (laughs) at our Basel. And so that was our IRL introduction to the world. And then following that was South by Southwest. And so essentially what Campfire does IRL for the most part is we'll have opportunities for creatives to create. We'll have studio time. We'll have opportunities for people to come hang out. We call it the Campfire House, which is the headquarters at whatever event that we have. We'll have some sort of usually either a brunch or dinner or some sort of like gathering event. So it's really cool because in the midst of all the panels and whatever else you experience at conferences, to have a place that's like a home and a safe haven that's focused on creating, commiserating, all of these things that creators need to flourish has been really special. Cool. Yeah, it sounds amazing to be able to create a space, you know, for that, I think is really important. And part of this, I think, really kind of integral and really fascinating shift that Web3 is inciting. It's like opportunity to in, to gather in spaces that you create for yourself and for other people who share your vision and as a way to obviously all the inequitable realities of the streaming paradigm exactly that's cool and then on top of all of those things of course you've got a few other projects in the works as well i know you're working on hear us out feel free to chat about that we'd love to hear more yeah shout out to hear us out my baby <laughs> Here's how it is brand new. It's not even two months old. Wow. River White and I, who's a, River is a fantastic human being, and she's someone who is in the Web3 space in both music and media, but also in the traditional world of entertainment. She's someone who I became friends with because of Tips, who's the founder of Economy. And we were just two women, two black women who were really trying to find our way in the space in the world. And we wanted to encourage and support other creatives and professionals who are also navigating these spaces. And we would talk in spaces a lot of times concurrently and folks would be like, y'all need to launch a podcast. We really <laughs> love like the energy. We love the advice. And then we just did it. We were like, okay, cool. We gave ourselves a timeline. We're like, okay, let's get the name, let's get the brand branding, let's figure out the schedule, let's figure out how we're gonna be able to build our community. And we gave ourselves a couple of weeks to do it, and then we launched it, and we've been going ever since. And it's hmm. been really cool to have something of our own. And also we're both really big on lifting as we climb. So like we're still finding our way through these spaces. We're still hmm. trying to reach amazing heights in both music and media. But as you're going on your journey, you can still reach back and help people who are trying to get where you are currently. So that's where a lot of the focus is. So it's really based on our anecdotal experience or things that we've seen work with people we admire. We meet every Sunday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. We discuss a different topic every week, live on Twitch. We have our community vote on what topics that they want to discuss. And cool. That's how we go about it. Cool. What have some of the topics been so far? So a number of different things. We've talked about how to network both IRL and online. And we've talked about how to combat imposter syndrome. We've talked about how to shoot your shot. 
And the interesting thing about the formatting of these episodes is that currently they only live on Twitch for up to two weeks. So we make it so if you're not there or if you don't watch it within that two week window, it's gone, baby. Eventually we'll probably (laughs) upload to YouTube or wherever else, but we're trying to make it so that it's like, you got to be in the building. Yeah. I like that. Experience it in real time. That's the way life worked before the internet. So why not? Exactly. So it's, you know, people are like, oh, I'll catch the recording. No, you won't. (laughs) <laughs> or at least you won't pass this window. You get a two-week grace period, which is plenty of time if you don't watch yeah. it within two weeks. Oh, well. That's already pretty generous, I think. Exactly. <laughs> uh, cool. And you've also got a newsletter that you've just started called What yes. Life Has to Say. Uh, yes. So this has been really fun for me. So this is actually my second newsletter. The first one I have is From One Creative to Another, which is essentially a monthly newsletter where I share different types of music industry opportunities for both creatives and executives that mm-hmm. are on the come up like myself <laughs> and also any like cool products that I think you should check out communities, events, things like that. And I started that two years ago now. Yeah. A little over two years ago. It was like one of my pandemic projects. And then what lot of day has to say is the newest one, which launched two weeks ago. <laughs> so brand spanking new, and that's more so for my long form content. So I spend mm-hmm. a lot of time discussing things that I find interesting in general. Like I I do this across social media um, and I do this in calls like this and in talks like this. And so I was like, okay, I need to have a home for the types of things that I like discussing in a long form sort of way. And I had seen other really great folks in the industry, Benjamin James, for example, Rob Abelo, and I really liked their newsletters. And I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna take a stab at launching my own. And it was actually my creator manager over at LinkedIn who had encouraged me to do. He was like, you have a lot of like great content and you do a lot of long form posts and you should consider having a newsletter where you can Mm. house some of those things. And I was like, you're right. Mm. (laughs) So I had a call with him and then not even a week after, or maybe it was a week about, I launched the newsletter. And I try to do things quickly. Like I don't like sitting on ideas for too long because one thing Mm -hmm. I realized about that is that if you sit on an idea for too long, it's not going to happen. So I say, I'm going to do it. I usually try to tell someone or tell the internet that I'm going to do it so they can hold me accountable. Yeah, and yeah. I do it. <laughs> it's a good tactic. <laughs> so, and it's been really fun. I, initially, when I launched it, I was like, okay, maybe I'll do stuff like bi-weekly because I didn't want to put too much pressure on myself. But mm. the way things move in music and tech and pop culture and the creator economy, it's fast. There's yeah. something to talk about every day. There's... So now it's become more of a weekly occurrence. And the first edition was something I did totally for fun very unrelated to anything that is currently happening. I like to ideate different things that companies can do to make themselves more cool. And I had randomly stumbled upon the fact that Cash App's birthday is on October 15th. And the reason I realized that is because I was working on my taxes and I realized that Cash App had allowed for free tax filing. Mm. And then I was like, wait a second, their birthday's coming up. And then I just started thinking like, Cash Up does all these cool things for pop culture. They should do this, that, and a third. And it's, I don't know if you know about that trend of $500,000 or dinner with Jay-Z. It, it's recurring every mm. day. There's someone talking about it. And I just decided to make a fun post about it. And then it became a whole article. And I was like, whatever. It's going to be the first edition. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And then the second edition, which launched actually just yesterday. I have them come out every Tuesday. Was in relation to Grimes mm. leading the charge in relation to AI music. So she had tweeted recently, and this is in response to the AI Drake song that was taken Mm -hmm. down by UMG everywhere. She had tweeted that she would allow folks to be able to use AI to recreate her vocals to make music. And if she liked it, or if the songs had done well, she would do like a 50-50 split with Mm -hmm. those folks. And I was like, this is the future. This is so cool. It's like, in a world where the traditional music industry is fighting against it, she's, let's do it. She's embracing it with open arms. And I was like, this is dope. And I hope that more people follow her example. So that's what I wrote about most recently. But yeah, like anytime there's something interesting, whether it's trending or not, I want to be able to discuss it in long form content. Totally. Yeah, it's a good way to, to organize and process your own thoughts about how you feel about something mm-hmm. too. Yeah, you know, I read the Grimes one and I think it's really fascinating. And I, I agree, I think... I, I have my own qualms about AI and it's like an existential despair sometimes <laughs> thinking about I, I feel like AI, <laughs> but I agree. It's like, 
with anything in technology, as we're proven over and over again, if you, mm -hmm. if you don't embrace it, if you don't adapt with it, you're going to get left behind. And that, I think that was like your subtitle was like, yeah, the music industry should follow her lead at the risk being left behind. And yeah. And the thing is, true. we've seen it already. We've seen it with Napster. We've seen it with Spotify. We've seen it with the advent of so many types of technologies. And it's just like, you see all of these tech companies that come in and create the solutions that both creators and consumers are looking for. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the music industry had like their own like emerging tech departments or whatever else to get ahead. Right. Don't wait for the tech bros and the VCs to push you out of the equation. Like you got to get involved in the conversation early so you can have a say or else you left the people complaining about being paid 0.0003 cents. It's like you, people need to get involved early. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I've been following. I mean, you, do you know Holly Plus as well, that project? So I've heard of it, but I need to go down that rabbit hole for sure. Yeah, she's been doing this as also planning ahead. Holly Herndon, she, she's she been working with AI for quite a while before it was even cool. Like you know, four or five years she's been yeah, doing this. Yeah, way and, before it was a trending topic. <laughs> yeah, like before ChatGPT, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but she, in kind of a prescient take, she, she foresaw all of, this happening so she created an ai model of, of her voice and then she built a dao which for those listening who don't know is a decentralized autonomous organization which which actually owns i think owns this model she's embracing the fact that people are going to be able to use my voice in the future through ai but if i set precedent right now and make it more of a collaborative effort like start mm -hmm. to involve people in this so we can create art together mm -hmm. that gets you out ahead of in, of the change before stampeded which is kind of the same thing grimes is doing right now too yeah i love that you said that getting ahead before you're stampeded because that's literally <laughs> what happens like it's not um, gentle you will yeah. be crushed <laughs> yeah crushed like we've seen what's happened with CDs and all these other, even iTunes. It's just like, you will be crushed if you do not keep up. Mm -hmm. Better yet, get ahead. Yeah, which is hard, especially as you're saying, the pace of everything is so fast. It's like, how am I supposed to I'm keep up? You, it's every day. Yeah. It's, it's every day. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it can um, be overwhelming for sure. Yeah. And, and we're just at the cusp, the beginning of what AI is going to Oh, very much. Do. So it's, we have to start to think about how it's going to change our world, how we can prepare, mm -hmm. how we can work with it and use it as a tool and so that we're not stampeded by it. Yeah, 100%. And I think one thing I really try to tell people is that don't look at AI as something that's going to replace human beings. That's not necessarily the point of AI. AI is supposed to be a co-pilot. Right. AI is supposed to be a tool that you're working with in order to help either make yourself more productive or bounce ideas off of or whatever else. I use ChatGPT every day, every yeah. day. It's a tool. It's like when Google launched a search engine. It's like, oh, wow, I can Absolutely. now like search like an indexed version of the entire internet. And it's like, Absolutely. why wouldn't I do this? And now obviously everybody uses Google. Google you know, is its own verb. And again, it's the same with ChatGPT. It's a tool we have at our disposal. It's to make our lives easier. And use it for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the hope that we can actually embrace something like this to make life better for human beings and right. create more space and time to pursue art, to do good in the world. That that's hope. that's like the optimistic version of this. Obviously, there's the opposite. opposite right. Thing. I choose to look at it more optimistically because I know from personal experience how much time it has saved me from mm -hmm. content calendar ideas to editing. It's just, it helps save me hours a day. Totally. Yeah, and one of the things you wrote about in the piece that I wanted to mention was the conversion of AI with Web3 and how those two things are gonna mm -hmm. work hand in hand around this idea that there's just gonna be a huge proliferation of content. Take the Drake song that just served, not really Drake song, the AI Drake song right. came out <laughs> and seeing like how he, it's really easy to create a piece of art that sounds like somebody else or an AI can do it 
really quickly it can proliferate it and just do it over and over mm -hmm. again and really the power of the blockchain is around like being able to verify authenticity of something yes so, so using that as protective mechanism absolutely you know, and, and like you know what's infinite. funny um web3 and blockchain tech in terms of how it reached the masses is ahead of its time right because initially the focus for Web3 and blockchain tech was in relation to NFT, which mm -hmm. we have seen <laughs> in a lot of ways, the rise and fall of that in terms of the boom, the NFT boom, but also in terms of how the general public responded, mm -hmm. which is overall very negatively. And I think mm -hmm. if we're able to shift the focus in terms of the benefits that are in relation to how it can authenticate things, like this is how this is the real thing. This is how you know that this is something that was actually like verified by said artist that you love. But then also beyond that, on the monetary side, which is something that Grimes had touched on, is that when it comes to the payments with smart contracts, you don't have to wait mm -hmm. for something to go through a PRO or go through mm -hmm. a publishing administrator or whatever else. You can be paid instantly as soon as it's streamed, as soon as it's sold. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's really important for creatives in general because we're used to at the earliest being paid in 30 days, net mm -hmm. 30, or up to even 18 months, depending on what kind of royalty it is or what sort it's of crazy. project it is or whatever <laughs> else. To have the ability to one, verify that something is authentic, but two, be able to compensate collaborators essentially instantly. That's something that's going to be really powerful as the rise of AI music continues to proliferate. Totally. I feel like that's feel like the public perspective toward NFTs would be different if that was how it was framed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I've always said from the very beginning, like it's not so much the technology that's the issue, it's mm. the marketing. Totally. <laughs> totally. And this is why it's really important for different types of founders and whoever else to have folks with the either like the soft skills or the skills that lean more towards aesthetics visuals, branding, marketing, advertising, because they understand the people and the psychology of what consumers want mm -hmm. in ways that unfortunately a lot of folks in tech, especially emerging tech, don't. Yeah. That's yeah, that's the reason we have the term NFT as like this leading Oh my God. Like why it's not a very pretty name, non fungible. Yeah, token. but even like the name chat GPT and, and no offense to those people, but it's true. It was not a branding person that came up with that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Like, totally. <laughs> all these acronyms, I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess people, that's probably how people are talking about it internally within an organization. And then that's how people start talking about it externally. I and it's just so funny to me because I'm like, why would you do this? <laughs> it doesn't have to be like this. Yeah. I think people are now catching on. It's, oh, we should talk about utility and the actual value Lead of this technology with value. Lead yeah. with utility and make it easy yeah oh i like ai is happening but oh i have this thing that can actually always verify authenticity oh wow what's that how does that work right. let me tell exactly. you <laughs> like instead of saying oh on the blockchain if you tell people this is how you verify something is true and this is how you get paid instantly their ears yeah, yeah. will perk up exactly like, wait what yeah that's <laughs> the pitch right there. <laughs> yeah totally Oh man, lost opportunity. <laughs> yeah. We can maybe fix that now. Right, right. Now, yeah, we learn from our mistakes and we move on and make something yes. better. Cool, Lottie. This has been really great. And I just have one more question for you. For sure. You're going to Desert Island. You get to bring three albums with you. What are they? Stop. <laughs> this is so hard. I know. It's an impossible question, but that's the point. So uh... Whatever comes to mind. Ah, okay <laughs> gotta say anti by rihanna for nice. sure because that is just her magnum opus and one of the most incredible bodies of work in existence mm. nice big words okay. so that's one cool uh, graduation by kanye west i know nice. he's canceled but <laughs> <laughs> i think yeah i feel like yeah, this album, music can still be great it's just every song on there is a classic it's, like, a, great, it's a great record and yeah. he's someone who, who's who been a huge inspiration to me and yeah that's got what i call manifestation music on there and it's changed my life okay we've got two 
this is so hard <laughs> you got two already it's been like 30 seconds you're doing great I'm only three. Oh man oh man <laughs> oh man ah! i feel like i need to bring like a pop album <laughs> cool britney spears which one i'm gonna go with self-titled nice spears, yeah it's a good trio i think there'll be it's pretty good vibes in that album or, yeah. or, or sorry on that island right that, that you're on I'm going to regret not bringing little baby, but it's okay. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's a hypothetical question. Hopefully this never actually happens. Uh, cool. Lottie. It's been really good to have you on really great chatting with you as always for the people listening. What's the best way for them to follow you or to get involved with any of the projects you're working in? First and foremost, subscribe to my latest newsletter. <laughs> Do it. And it's great. you can find all of my links actually in one place. So Koji, which is K-O-J-I dot T-O slash lot of day with an X at the end. So that's L-A-D-I-D-A-I-X. So go to that link and you'll find all my stuff. I have the same at everywhere, even on Blue Sky, even mm. on Nostra, like Sky. even the most like obscure social network I have the same <laughs> at. <laughs> which is l-a-d-i-d-a-i-x so search that on google or go on twitter first and you'll find everything else i'm consistent cool. you're gonna find nice <laughs> nice i love that consistency is great cool thanks again lottie really great to have you here thank you so much for having me this is a really fun conversation absolutely i agree all right that's it for this episode of big brother and the hodling company I'm your host, McKeegan Voice, and you can keep up with me and all the latest Web3 music trends on Twitter at McKeegan. That's M-A-C-E-A-G-O-N. This show is a production of Decentral Media, and you can visit us at Decentral.io, and remember, only you can prevent and fend off. Big Brother. <laughs>